Oh, hello, my beautiful, wonderful friends. This is my March wrap up. Can you tell I was just really trying to be enthusiastic and faking it? I'm already tired. But as usual, you all try to keep me entertained during these wrap ups and sent me some questions on Instagram. So I'm just gonna pull up all the screenshots that I took. And this isn't the order I'm talking about them in. I'm just gonna grab whatever is relevant to the question. Thanks so much for sending them in. I endlessly think it's hilarious when people get mad at the amount that people read and they're like, people are reading, speed reading for competition. People are trying to impress people. Like, I wish I could pretend I didn't read this many books. I don't wanna read this many books. This is just the amount that I end up reading to put out all the content I wanna make. And there's so damn many, and these wrap ups are so freaking long. <laughs> I'm tired of this, Grandpa. Let's start with Elizabeth's comment. Which book spent the longest time on your TBR? If you know, you know. We'll just get this one out of the way. Last Kiss by Laura Lynn Page. I read for a video where I was going through my TBR closet and um, reading some things that I have no reason for why I own. And this is one of them because I read the first book, first touch in 2016 and I immediately like not I think I pre-ordered this is like one of my first pre-orders ever the sequel because it left on a cliffhanger and so I reread this book this month and then the sequel this is about a girl named Emily Emily and she um gets involved with this man named Reeve under false pretenses because she believes that he is the reason that her best friend is dead slash missing. He's very rich and well connected and she just shows up at one of his hotels one day and seduces him and um, she's trying to find out the answer to her best friend's like disappearance or change in personality and that's it. I don't need to talk about these books. They're not good. I gave them both a two and I'm glad I got it off my TBR closet though now it's gonna sit on my red shelf for the entire year until I do all of my stats and things at the end. Oh, and did I mention it's like erotica? It's an erotic duology and I shouldn't have read it. I shouldn't have owned it. The next question is what character would you go on a date with? I, hold on, I need to think this one through. Um, okay, I wanna go with like one of the realistic fictions, but I think my answer is gonna be Wendell from Emily Wilde's Map of the Other Lands, just because he's a hoot and a half. This is a book, oh, another main character named Emily. And um, in the first book in this series, she is writing an encyclopedia about fairies and she is a cold kind of individual, doesn't really understand connecting with people and is trying to get information out of them, but isn't warm and inviting. And so Wendell pops into the picture, her academic rival, but he is very charming and um, helps her with a lot of things begrudgingly. And they just kick off this romance while going on a lot of little side quests. In this one, they are finding out more about Wendell's past and Emily continues to get into wild circumstances. I'm so excited for the third book because I think it's gonna take place um, in a certain environment. And I think we're gonna see Emily and Wendell's, well, obviously we're gonna see their romantic arc um, complete itself. And I'm excited to watch that happen because Wendell is just such a, I know some people don't love him and like that's what steered them away from the first book and made them not wanna continue. I love Wendell. He's kind of sassy, but he's also like a golden retriever. He's obsessed with Emily. And while I would not want to steal her man, I think we would have a fun time. What's next? I don't know if you've done this, but what title best describes the plot of the book? What title best describes the plot of the book? I think this is actually an idea for me to organize the wrap up in that way. I mean, this one is pretty spot on. That time I got drunk and saved a demon by Kimberly Lemming. Oh my God, I haven't been telling you, I didn't tell you my reading of this one. I gave the second Emily Wilde a 3.5. And that's just because the first one was a five and this one was just a watered down version of that. Like every single aspect of it was slightly less exciting. So this one was a 3.75 and it is about a girl. This is Cinnamon. Her family owns like the spice farm and all of her siblings are named after spices. And the Cinnamon actually has this kind of, um, uh, magical quality that you come to learn in the book, which is really fun. And one day she is drunk and she's just like such a fun protagonist to follow because she's not like strong and brave and wants to take on this uh, situation where she has to take down this goddess where the goddess it has like banned demons from their area and she's saved all of the humans and she's like perfect and great and wonderful. And then when Cinnamon stumbles upon this demon in the woods, the demon goes, that's not actually true. That goddess is a, uh, you know, 
exiled witch and she's terrible and we need to take her down so come along with me and let's accomplish these tasks cinnamon is not interested she just wants to get drunk and sit on a porch and drink and have fun and be silly but she's whisked off on this adventure there is like a good amount like four sex scenes in here but it is much more plot focused than i thought and obviously the title perfectly describes what you're getting into next up what book has the best audiobook narration okay let me look at the ones that i listened to on audio some of Feybound, but i didn't like it emily wilde actually emily wilde might be my vote for that one because i really like the audiobooks i also listened to we sold our souls Oh, actually, my vote is going to be for the nonfiction. This is Dinner on Monster Island by... Essays by Tanya Di Rosario. Tanya Di Rosario. And I just always prefer a nonfiction when it's written or it's narrated by the author because you just get so much more of a personal take on things. This I gave a four. I randomly picked it up from my library because I thought the cover was stunning. And it turned out to be my perfect genre that I talk about all the time, which is a mix of memoir, personal anecdotes, and also a commentary on media. So if you like things that I've liked, like uh, A Little Devil in America or It Came From the Closet, I would definitely suggest this to you. Is what the author's personal experience growing up in Singapore, queer, brown, and fat, as she describes herself, and the moments of impact in her life related to that perception of her and how people have treated her throughout her life and their like desire to change her. So it talked about things like her viewing horror movies and how people are seen in horror movies. It spoiled a lot of things. I wrote them all down in case, um, you wanted to be prepared. Uh, Carrie, The Exorcist, The Ring, The Witch, The Shining, Doctor Sleep, and The Craft. Especially how young girls are portrayed in horror, the things that happen to them, um, things like the cultural significance of long hair in Asian media especially, and how it's like used in horror. Things like growing up um, with this government initiative in Singapore of different schools trying to fight childhood obesity, but in not being very regulated and how every school treated it differently and children were literally bullied like by teachers and treated terribly. It also talked about COVID response. And I know there's another memoir that I can't remember at this point, but one that talks about how um, COVID was treated in a certain country. And I remember thinking it was so interesting getting to hear actual um, perspective on that and how like the media is fed certain statistics and then we are fed certain statistics about how different countries different cities are responding to covid and how certain places are seen as like look how well they handled things and singapore is one of those places that is touted as look at their covid response but the way that she broke things down and explained how a significant portion of their data is skewed because they only used certain populations as examples and migrant workers, which take up so much of the population weren't included in statistics, when in fact they were the ones being treated horribly, um, being isolated in really unsafe environments and death tolls were much higher than we would ever know. It covered so many topics and it was really interesting. There were some things it left out but teased towards about her life and this I imagine could be something that um, is a precursor to a larger uh, memoir in the future from this author that I would absolutely read because I loved exploring all of this with her. And the audiobook is available on Everand if you're interested. I'll put my link down below. I think I have a link. I don't know. It changed from Scribd to Everand and I don't know how it works anymore. <laughs> I'm sure it's also available on Libro FM. So if you want to use that link, I'll put that down below because I know I have one of those. Uh, next, which book cover do you love the most this month? Okay, so maybe I should have saved that question for this one. Let me pick something that I love. I'm going to go with Mirrorland by Carol Johnstone because the cover of this is what intrigued me to pick it up in the first place. Her covers seem very surreal and ominous and don't to me give off just suspense thriller vibes, but that's what her books are. And I wish I had known that going in because this was not a great experience for me. It was a three and I was kind of just waiting for that otherworldly quality to come into it. And it wasn't that. This is the story of two sisters. One of them is missing and the other one goes back to the small town that she lives in and is trying to find her. She's convinced that her sister is is setting up like this scavenger hunt for her but other people are convinced she's dead and it's just a lot of family secrets and uncovering who said what and who did what and who's in a relationship with who there's a lot of tension between these sisters and you got to see them in different timelines and there were some twists and turns at the end that got me which is what brought it to a three out of five because i want to be entertained and surprised and i was surprised by some things i didn't love the twists there was like two reveals and at this point i don't remember them but i remember not liking them so a bit of a forgettable one unfortunately next up which book would you recommend to someone you hated 
That's crazy. She says as she's the one who screenshotted that comment. Maybe this one because I don't know what the point was and if I forced you to read it and you had to spend 88 pages being as frustrated and confused as me like maybe that would that would be fun for me if I was giving it to my enemy. I can't think of who that would be. But I don't even want to pitch this. I do not know what it is. It's Conversation of Three Wayfarers by Peter Weiss. And um, it's these three men, I guess, <laughs> talking back and forth to each other. But there's no explanation of who's talking or when. There's no breaks. It's just a stream of consciousness um, experiences they've had. Crawling around under a chair and... Um, smoking from their pipe and seeing a pig and hitting someone with a hammer. It was so strange and not in a good way. Next is We Sold Our Souls, the book version of Divorce Dad Rock. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm gonna pull that book out. Someone also said, can you rank all Grady Hendrix books you've read? And I will gladly. So I don't think that this is Divorce Dad's rock music in a book, though it is very fast paced and um, it has a lot of extreme circumstances and electric guitars. I think this can appeal to a lot of different people. And I think that about all of Grady Hendrix stuff, he introduces a lot of female characters and delves into their experiences and women um, being exploited and being preyed upon and explores their emotions and their relationships. And I think does that well. So my ranking, let me pull up everything he's ever written to make sure I get this correct. Um, this book is about a band and back in the day one of the band members became more famous than the others and got this other extra opportunity became one of the most famous people in the world and the rest of the band believes it's because he sold their souls to get this record deal and just left them in the dust and now current day we're following one of them as the main character Tris and she is finding evidence of like what happened somebody comes to her door and they tell her that something horrible is going to happen to him she sees some horrific things happen and now she's on this mission to like meet with the other band members make sure everybody's safe and people have different views on like what happened to them my ranking i haven't read horror store but i will soon i promise my least favorite Gertie hendrix is how to sell a haunted house and then the final girl support group we Sold Our Souls, then My Best Friend's Exorcism, and then at the top is The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. I still have never given Grady Hendrix a five, but I appreciate what he's doing with his books. Next comment, how do you feel about predicting The Honey Witch as one of your favorites of the year? Kaylee, why would you remind me of that? So I did indeed say that I feel like there's no way I'm not gonna love this. It's cottagecore, sapphic, which is what could go wrong. Um, I gave this a 2.5. I just don't think it fully met its potential. It is beautiful. And if there's another question in here that is like a book that you would still recommend even though you didn't like it, it's this one. Obviously it hasn't come out yet. This was an ARC kindly, kindly gifted to me by the publisher. It comes out in May. And I think that people will still enjoy this. I don't think it's gonna pop off as like the best fantasy of the year, but I don't think people will dislike it. Not that I hated it, like a 2.5 is just so average. It was just such an average experience. I have zero feelings towards this. And I think it's because these characters didn't feel like real characters. The magic of it all and the stakes never fully met their potential. So we're following Marigold and at the beginning of the book, her grandmother who she like has never connected with before comes and tells her that she is a witch. And she goes because her grandmother can no longer fulfill her duties as the honey witch of the area. Now, Marigold is responsible for being the witch. There are other dark witches, there's a threat to the land, but like that's not really what the book is. And I wanted it to be her like, harnessing her power, training, getting ready for like this big battle for the darkness. And if you're thinking that's not really what a cozy fantasy is supposed to be, I know, but it still was somehow that dark intense fantasy, but only for 50 pages. And if we were gonna do that, it should have been building to that rather than the found family that it was and just the cozy softness. But the cozy softness wasn't fully there because all of the characters felt so generic. Um, we had like a grumpy sunshine dynamic, but the grumpiness was so unexplored. It was just like this miserable person and it wasn't really fun to follow. We got some of her backstory, but didn't get to know her. And even Marigold as our main character, we never really got to know the things that 
she cares about and the thoughts that she has it was just everyone was existing it was violent it was cozy it was steamy it didn't balance all of those things properly so that's that in my opinion just my opinion next would you want to know the length of your string if you were in the measure um that's the natural question you have when finishing this book and I think this is such a good book club pick because and read with Jenna like it makes sense that she did it also this has a lot of like political and um war conversations that I wasn't expecting and it would obviously lead to the conversation of if you woke up one day and you opened a box on your doorstep that had a length of string that implied how long you were going to live either you know a couple days or decades would you want to know and I think most people would say no it's like the question of would you want to know the date that you're going to die I don't think or how you're going to die I don't think many people would want that let me know if I'm wrong in the comments below because maybe you feel like you could prepare for it or you could live in peace knowing that you don't have to worry so much leading up to that date. But I would not want to know. Do not tell me. I do not want that information. So in this book, we're following a whole bunch of different characters as they discover their string. And the way that the string, nobody knows how it got there, how it arrived, um, if it's true until people start dying and it is all aligning with the length of their strings. We see how the government has to shift, how different political candidates are treated based on the length of their string, if people remain in their relationships that they're in, the jobs that they're in, based on now how they view their life. It was really, really fascinating. It wasn't as fun as I wanted. I gave it a four. It was the sentimental, thought-filled, existential kind of book that it wanted to be. I just wanted it to be a little like sillier, maybe a few more like random perspectives that weren't so serious. Very glad I read it and would recommend to many. What book would you recommend to past you? Okay, well naturally there's one YA book here. I don't know that um, TJ Power has something to prove by Jasmine Cordillo would do anything for me if I read it as a teen that it didn't do now, but it would have diversified my reading obviously as a teen so also it's set where I live so I would have found that so fucking cool when I was a teenager this is about a girl in high school who is pretty and popular on the debate team she's smart she's got like everything that she wants and um her cousin is not that and mostly it's because of how she is perceived um within the beauty standard and how they're treated differently She's like one of the prettiest girls in school, but her cousin isn't even seen the same way. She has a unibrow and a mustache and, you know, body hair everywhere. TJ spends a lot of time crafting her appearance to fit in and she waxes and she shaves and she doesn't think that there's anything wrong with that and doesn't think that her cousin not wanting to do those things, there's anything wrong with that. But she is challenged one day um, when her cousin is being really relentlessly made fun of and she starts to wonder if I went with my natural like appearance, would I then be treated differently? Or like it's something to prove. She's trying to prove to herself that she would still be loved and cared for and popular I guess if she looked different. I gave this one a four. It was the thing that I pulled out of my members TBR jar. It was something I was gonna actually center an entire vlog around going around the different places that the book mentioned where I live. It was not that. It was basically all taking place at her home, at her school, and then sometimes in completely different cities because she's traveling for debate. It turned out to be a really good time regardless. I think it perfectly balanced her challenging you know what she thinks of herself and what other people think of herself it had really good messages also not everybody is going to like, agree with what she does and her takeaways at the end um i think it balanced friendship and her and this there was a lot of debate in here which as somebody who was on the debate team was fun to follow her getting the different prompts and um dealing with the different challenges and there was also this great romance in here that i wasn't expecting it was funny it was soft and i would not hesitate to recommend this one either. Next up we've got which book would you reread? That's fun. I feel like I would go with Feybound because I know this is oh my god. Because in thinking about the books the types of books that I would be most likely to reread it's when they are fantasy stories. These are the two like fairy fantasy books that are the kickoff to series that I read this month. And when the sequels come out I feel like I would be inclined to reread the first books but this one I would never want to do that to myself. So 
this is my answer. Um, Feybound by Sarah L. Arifi. First of all, this was a four, so it was obviously enjoyable and I would want to reread it. But secondly, because there's a lot introduced in here and I think it would be good to remind myself of all of those things before I read the next book. In this, we're following elf sisters and they get trapped in this fairy world that they didn't know existed. They learn a lot of things, the customs, they get involved in various um, areas of the world and the kind of political climate. One of them comes from being a head of an army and she has a sapphic relationship within these pages. And then the other one, Lettel, Lettel and Yurin, also has a romantic relationship with somebody who came into the fairy world with them. They're both like really interesting to follow. There are these crystals that people are, or creatures are fighting over. There are these really interesting um, companions. There's this interesting mind communication. There's this drum magic that was also fascinating to learn about. And just finding out about these two different worlds and how they differ and the similarities and how one is impacting the other. There was a lot of learning to be had in here. And I think it could be dry for some people. I gave it a four. Um, and I wonder how we're going to see so many different things develop now that we have gotten so much knowledge, what's going to happen in future books. Let me find a question that I can answer for this one, since it's already in my hand. Which book did you buy that made you regret spending money on that book? Unfortunately, it's Lore of the Wilds. This is so incredibly beautiful, but it was $35. And it is the first book in a duology. We have our main character, Lore. She is a human and she enters the fairy world. As her human village has been really controlled by the fairies, they're kind of prisoners. Um, the fairies are evil and everybody hates each other. And she gets this opportunity to um, go through the fairy library and uncover things and ends up uncovering a magical book and finding like magic of her own. And then fleas and there are these fairies that she's involved with both of them for no real reason <laughs> the romance was so painful and unconvincing and the dialogue was really contrived and the world building was not to my taste the pacing the writing it was not a good time for me i felt really bogged down by it constantly reminding me of the stakes and constantly setting up future scenarios and then reflecting on the scenarios when the actual scenario only took place for like a page but there was just so much exposition laura was pretty insufferable i like the idea of her like learning that things are not as they seem that is a theme in books that i love where she's uncovering like the fairy and the human real relationship and the history that has been hidden from her people. And I think I'll read the sequel to find out what the full arc of that all is. But just the way that this one of the main relationships developed in here did not feel genuine. And I wish that the author had committed to like, the crazy drama that it could have been and like fully went there with her characters and their relationships, because it would have felt more extreme when all of the reveals happened. But I feel like the book almost spoiled itself with those reveals because she didn't let fit things fully happen. <laughs> I have a full rant review with spoilers um, in a channel members video, but we'll move on because the book makes me angry. I gave it one star. Which books made you bump an author up or down that you want to read more from or won't read more from? So I can answer two for that one. An author I want to read more from and an author I don't want to read more from. You know what's funny? I actually think I have one author that I can answer for both of those things because when I read The Tale of the Tailor and the Three Dead Kings by Dan Jones, I hated it. Uh, I gave this two stars because I enjoyed the section at the beginning that explained where he originally found this story and why he wanted to flesh it out and retell it. Um, and I hated the story. Like, I don't think it was well written. And also, it just didn't need to, like, it wasn't a story. It was just this, like, person and his horse, right? It was his horse? How do I not remember? Like, walking through the woods and they see a raven and a man and a dog and then the book is over it's supposed to be a ghost story but it's not and I don't want to read more fiction from this author if he did happen to do more retellings of ghost stories that he uncovers in his medieval research but people told me that Dan Jones is actually a really well-known non-fiction author who uh people have learned a lot from about his like medieval I guess explorations of in his books so I think I would read some non-fiction from him but not something similar to that 
Let me also pull two mystery books out because I don't think I have that many more questions screenshotted. This is an author I would read more from. This is one I wouldn't, though I don't really know anything about Mary Diam. If this author is still actively publishing or, but I just know I wouldn't read more in this series. We have a main character, Judith, who lives in this small town and it's Easter weekend. She is working and doing stuff. And there's this man in an Easter bunny suit who kills another man in town and they she has to help uncover this mystery and I guess that's what all of the bed and breakfast mysteries are going to be. I just found it dry. I think I gave it maybe I gave it two stars because like it's a cozy mystery so some of my issues with it that's not really fair. Like there being too many characters and it just being like a suspenseful neighborhood story it just wasn't that interesting to me and then everything that actually was the reason for why everything happened I just didn't really like it so I wouldn't read more but Jesse Q Satanto I have read Dial A for Aunties and then I didn't really like the sequel and I was thinking should I read more from this author oh my god Vera Wong's unsolicited advice for murderers was exactly the tone and the feelings that I had from Dial A for Aunties and it gave me this renewed sense of joy I gave this a 4.25 oh I can also answer the question is there going to be a live show for this yes it is the upcoming weekend and I can't wait to talk with you all about this. So in here, Vera Wong, all I knew is this woman runs a tea shop and she comes down one day from her, you know, house above and discovers there is a dead man. And now she calls the police and lets them do the investigation, but she's also inserting herself a lot, kind of takes something from the scene and wants to have uh, an investigation of her own and is looking into all of her customers. Now, what I didn't know is it's also from the perspective of those customers and we have like this whole group of characters and we learn about their personal lives and a lot of them seem really suspicious but you're reading from their perspective so they're like all hiding something but they're also letting you in on what's going on. It was a found family story so it was cozy, it was funny, like I laughed. I even like welled up a little bit near the end. It was heartwarming, it was funny. It was a little predictable, which is why I can't give it the full five. Um, but it was just as wacky as I wanted it to be. And it exceeded my expectations. Even though like I picked this as a book club pick, I wanted it to be great. I read the first chapter in a try a chapter video and loved it. I didn't think that like I didn't know for sure this would be great. But it was great. Okay, there were a couple specifically about Finley. So I'll get to that one. This is Finley Donovan Rolls the Dice by Al Cosimano. It's the fourth book in the Finley Donovan series. Somebody said I read and enjoyed the first Finley Donovan so much and decided to not continue in the series. Am I missing out? And then someone else said, do I need to read book three to fully enjoy slash understand book four? So the first thing is, yes, you absolutely have to read these in order. They're not like a cozy mystery where every book can exist independently. It is an like overarching storyline. There's basically like a new villain that gets introduced, a new threat in every single book for these four books straight. And then by the end, she has four different people who are all like, after her doing something to her like a threat and that all pretty much gets resolved by this fourth book which is all I was looking for. I gave it a four. It brought back like the magic I felt with the first book. It was full of the wacky experiences I wanted. There was just enough of Vero and Finley's dynamic. There was a romance to follow. Her relationship with her kids, her mother. There was a lot of conversations in here that I enjoyed. So I had a good time with it. I think I'll probably stop the series here. I think there will be new mysteries introduced in future books if there are going to be future books. Um, and I'll wait and see if people love it and maybe continue. But I'm happy with these four. And I think if you loved the first one and didn't love the second one or the third one, this redeems itself. But if you've only read the first one, I don't think you have to continue. The first book is just so good on its own. And though there are a lot of things to be curious about and wonder and a little bit of a cliffhanger that makes you want to pick them up, the first one can be read more so as a standalone. And unless it was like your favorite and you gave it five stars, I wouldn't say you're missing out. I don't think you need to continue in the series, but I really liked how it ended as far as like these four books as a, as a group. And I'm happy that I read it. Next we've got which book would you most like to see adapted to film and I really would watch the Finley Donovan experience and then these two have already been adapted or are on their way to being adapted so I can't answer those 
and the others I just don't really feel that way about. But I do love a rom-com. I will always watch a rom-com. And I think if the partner plot by Christina Forrest got developed, they would make it even funnier than the book because that's just what you have to do in a movie. Um, because this is more on the fun side than the serious side and I would love to watch it. I only gave this one a three. I know that I shouldn't be picking up romance, like I know that about myself, but I still continue to do it and I know that I'll find a huge win one, one day, but this was not it. Uh, in here we're following these two who are high school sweethearts. We have Violet and Xavier, and Violet is currently a celebrity stylist. She hasn't talked to Xavier, who is currently a high school teacher in, what, like, a decade but they run into each other in Vegas and they get drunk and they have this wild night where they accidentally get married and they decide to continue with the ruse because they're both benefiting from faking being together. There's different timelines in the book like one of them decides that they're gonna fake be together first and does it without the other person's consent really but it's kind of a marriage of convenience they're both getting something out of it and it's fake dating and something brings them back into the small town that they came from together uh where they have to be in forced proximity a lot of tropes which is fun and you see their relationship re-blossom after so many years what was missing for me in here is when we got flashbacks to their high school relationship I was eating it up and I wish that it had been dual timeline and we got to see them in the past just as much as the present because they had so much chemistry and it was just like really sweet to see the beginning of their relationship and I wanted more of that rather than like the serious adult heavy topics that came into it later but I also like needed to see them as adults and the second chance romance of it all. They were both really good characters. I would recommend this one. I think their relationship makes sense. I didn't have an issue with any of this. It just wasn't like as fun and funny as what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something really specific in romance and it didn't totally deliver, but it was good. Next up, which book would make a good or the best book club pick? Now, I would say these two because this is my book club pick and this is someone else's book club pick and there are great conversations to be had. I would say The Memory Place by Yoko Ogawa because this has a lot of conversations that you could have in it with a group of people. When I originally reviewed this, I said, this is the kind of thing that I remember reading in high school. An idea presented to you, the book not really having a satisfying ending necessarily, leaving you with a lot of wonderings and ponderings that you get to do after the fact. So this exists in a future society or just an alternate society. It feels dystopian, but it also is speculative. So people, on this island are just used to things disappearing and their memories being wiped in a way of the things that they're losing. So like one day birds disappear and all of your memories of birds disappear. And then there's this memory police who are tasked with going door to door and finding any evidence of birds or anybody who believes in birds and taking care of that threat, like whatever that means. So they, there are certain people who might have memories, most people don't, and you also don't have memories of having those memories so you don't feel like you've lost anything. The only way that you would know is if somebody in your household is one of the few that has these memories of things that are lost. So we're following a main character whose mother had that and she lost her mother and now meets this man who also has this ability and she decides to help him keep him in her home harbor him and keep his secret while she's going about life existing in her career um talking to various people having these things disappear around her and things that get disappeared start to get like a little bit weird which was just really fun to follow this is my only five star of the month it was so interesting but i wouldn't recommend it for everybody because i think there's a bit of an unsatisfying or unexpected quality when you think you're picking up something that's like george orwell that's about the age of surveillance that's about tyrannical governments it's not what i expected and it's not as intimidating as i expected i think there is such a huge audience for this and like I know this is popular so people are already finding it. I'm sure there are book club discussions of this and there's a lot of takeaways and different interpretations that different people could have and I think that that's really cool. Then we've got um oh did you like The Woods All Black more or less than the author's previous novella? So I just read The Woods All Black and if you watched my birthday vlog it might have seemed like a bit of an abrupt end because I vlogged this. I started vlogging it. I also went out like 
on my birthday, bought myself a bike <laughs> and vlogged that and um, started reading this and was not vibing with it and just decided to cut the vlog off and post it the way that it already was because I didn't want to end it with not a great reading. And I was, this just brought me back to like the beginning of 2023 when I had so much muchly anticipated horror and they all were flopping for me. And I don't want that to be my experience in 2024, but my average rating for this month is a three. Last month it was also a three. So I'm just not feeling great about it. I like this less than the author's previous novella, whatever it's called, We Feed Them Silence or Feeding Them Silence, something like that. Um, but I like it more than their novel Summer Suns. I think I also would continue to read more, but this was just not, I don't know. It's, I can't say it's not what I, is it not what I expected? It says it's historical horror, trans romance, and blood-soaked revenge. This is not a bad book. I think many people will love this. I was waiting for the horror for way too long considering how short this is. I just like a punchier novella. Everything this book talked about and introduced, the atmosphere, the setting was so incredibly well described and great. It was written fine. It's about Leslie who's a trans man in the 1920s and is going to this small township being hired as a nurse and he has to present himself as his gender assigned at birth um, as a woman because it's 1920s in a small town. It has it's very religious and for safety and career this is just what he has to do. He wants to support the people of this community but the community does not want him there. Um, they believe that everything should just be between a man and a woman and there doesn't need to be any insertion of any like doctor-like figure into their lives helping with pregnancy and birth and vaccines. And so they're already very unaccepting of this individual. And when he arrives, he presents masculine. Um, he doesn't, ha he's not married. And so they see him as a woman in their community who is not worthy of even speaking to. And I think that setting was so good. It was very vivid, but it was just so much of the book and that's not what I was looking for. I wanted a horror. And once it got to the horror, the type of horror that it was, was not for me. And the romance was not for me. It all just became so unexpected and um, wild and unhinged, but for such a small portion of it that I just, I don't know, I can't give this more than a three. I don't know if it's, I'm gonna say like a 2.75, I guess. But I really truly think people will love this. And I don't even have like a list of books that I would recommend. I feel like Sarah Gately, both of these two combined with a little bit of like the reformatory because of the historical setting. And then like something else monstrous and beast-like I would throw in there. It wasn't my perfect vibe, but I get it. Now we've got which books titles were featured in the text. Again, this was like a how to organize the wrap up, I think type of intended comment. Should I just go through them all? This title, specifically The Memory Place, was in it. Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murders was not in it. The Measure, the actual phrase The Measure, was probably in it. The Woods All Black was not in the text. Okay, let me pull out ones that actually were though. Maybe one that wasn't, one that wasn't, because I've, I've run out of comments. Are You Sleeping by Kathleen Barber? I don't feel like the phrase, are you sleeping, was ever actually in here. This was a mystery about sisters. One of them is responsible for sending their father to prison um, when they were younger because he killed somebody. It's funny because in my review, I said that this was readable but forgettable, and I completely agree at this point. I remember flipping through wanting to know what happened, but I was never really that invested. And I have now indeed completely forgotten what happens in here. There's a podcast host who wants to find out the truth because uh, the person who went to prison, did they just die? The synopsis doesn't tell me, <laughs> um, so I don't remember. But the podcast host is dedicated to finding out the truth. And I think that what it balanced well, I remember, is the conversations about the exploitative nature of true crime and podcasts of the nature of that nature, um, how they can be that and they can reopen like wounds of people who are really involved and it can be become sensationalized. But also the important fact of like, the prison system is incredibly messed up. And so there is a need for people to be helping the people who might be wrongfully imprisoned. 
Anyway, I gave it a three. There are multiple timelines. I was entertained and I remember being surprised by some things, I think. <laughs> Couldn't tell you the ending now. I remember having a good time because it was mixed media and there's some actual podcast and interview stuff in here. But yeah, pretty forgettable. I don't think the writing was anything to write home about. And then this title was definitely inside the book itself because it's Little Blue Encyclopedia for Vivian by Hazel Jane Plant. And this is a really interesting, ambitious, a fun little book where it is written like an encyclopedia. You get all the letters from A to Z and in each section you're learning about various characters and situations that take place in this TV show. So there's a TV show called Little Blue that exists in this book and it just has all of these characters living in this small town, their relationships, and we learn about the characters and their relationships throughout. And then we're also learning about the people who made the show, actors on the show, producers of the show, just a full encyclopedia of that show. And the reason that we're getting it is because we have a character named Vivian who recently died, who was a trans woman, and her trans friend is leading us through the encyclopedia, writing the encyclopedia, and sharing Vivian's life story, their friendship, their relationship, and Vivian's obsession with this TV show, and why. Um, our character thinks that she was in love with it and what it offered them and their friendship. It was a good time. I have no complaints about this. I could not get fully invested into this fictional TV show the way that I wanted to be. So I ended up giving it a 3.5, but it had an emotional impact by the end. Obviously you have a character who has passed. It definitely kept my attention, kept me reading. Uh, it just wasn't like the best thing I've ever read, but I would recommend that one. And now I just have these three, which I don't have any more questions for. So I don't really want to review this more than I did in the video because I didn't really like it. It's The Devil You Know by Jen Farrell. This is a kind of local author and I found this in a local-ish bookstore years and years ago. I gave it a two. It is a uh, different stories of various like mostly adolescent, um, teenage, young adult women and their experiences with relationships and body image and pregnancy and things of that nature. I thought it was fine. I didn't really get anything from it. And then Notes of a Crocodile by Q Mao Jin translated by Bonnie Huey was another 3.5. I actually feel like I would recommend these in tandem. If you loved one of these, read the other one. And it's set in 1980s Taipei. And following a bunch of queer characters, we have a main narrator who is unnamed but has a nickname. And I think she's just supposed to represent uh, queerness at this time and in this situation and the way that people are treated, um, the lack of acceptance and the fear of um, like being with the person you want to be with and how that will be seen by society. So she gets into a relationship with an older woman and it talks about that dynamic. Um, a lot of like just friends of hers and all of their friendship and what they're all dealing with in life. But then also there are, it's like surrealism because there are these crocodiles that are kind of taking over the city. And once in a while you get an insight into the crocodiles lives and what they're up to. And they just like are kind of living like humans and wearing suits and smoking. And it's just a very strange little book and it's very sad and um, learning about the author made it a good experience because you can see how much she put into the book and what she might have been feeling. Um, it was it was a tough read, but it was also a fun, like quirky read. And then lastly, we have Hawk Mountain by Connor Habib. This, this was a book. Have I solidified my rating? Not sure. In this moment, I think I would give it a four. Tonally, I would probably say like, it reminded me a bit of Fever Dream and Death of a Bookseller. Though those mostly revolve around women. Um, this revolves around two men, but it like gave me those kind of vibes where you're following kind of unhinged people, but you don't really know what's going on. Things are a little confusing and weird. And it's really about obsession. So we have these two men who meet on a beach one day and they haven't spoken for like 15 years, but they went to school together. And we get dual timeline. We're back in high school. We're seeing their relationship. One of them is bullying the other. Um, and we see that all developing. And then in the current timeline, one of them has a son and the one of the men 
is really inserting himself into their lives, like moving into their house, like trying to parent the child. And it's this very weird situation. And the other man is trying to get him out of the house and trying to grapple with raising his son and his relationship with his parents and um, the mother of the son who's not really in the picture, but we don't know why. But at the same time as it's just about their relationship, it's still like very surface level. I don't think we go very psychologically into these men's minds. We don't get to know them. They're not these really vivid characters. It's just strange things happening and it gets absolutely unhinged. But it's also a very slow wait to get there. It's about this like slow manipulation and um, our main character and this father is also working as a teacher and trying to keep certain things out of his professional life. And this man just like being on the periphery of every single aspect is making him feel really paranoid. And if like things about his life and his past life are going to like be revealed, it's so uncomfortable. Like there's just this sense of dread. And then once like a big event happens, it just is so sad. It just feels like exhausting to read and just depressing. Everything's just like toppling down for these men in their situation. And I don't know, it was, it was about like homophobia too. There was a lot of lack of acceptance and there was a lot of hatred and a lot of internalized like misogyny. And it was really interesting. It could have been a little weirder, and it could have been a five. But that is the 25 books that I read in the month of March. Thank you so much for listening to me. If you maybe skipped around to get to the ones you were most interested in, let me know what those were. And if my review helped, you know, convince you to read it or not read it, I am happy that you're here regardless. And I will see you in a couple days with my quarterly wrap up. I have not had that many wins, but I'm excited to tell you what those were, my favorites of the quarter, and then all of my stats because I love stats. So see you then. Bye!